All right, everyone, if we could please find a seat where we get started here. Uh, welcome back for those that have joined us from the previous session. Um, if you're just joining us for the first time, my name is Keeler Sweeney. I'm the Common Ground Initiative Program Manager with the Holland Science Center. Before we begin, I want to let you know that we'll be collecting question cards from the audience for our Q&A today. Holland Science Center staff will be available to collect those cards and forward your questions on to the speakers, who will respond once we transition to the Q&A element. I want to introduce our guest speakers. So joining us now digital, digitally is Congressman Charlie Dent, who now serves as Executive Director and Vice President of the Aspen Institute Congressional Program, where he leads bipa bipartisan, bicameral po policy education programs for sitting members of Congress. In addition to his role at the Aspen Institute, Congressman Dent is a political commentator for CNN, a senior policy advisor to the global law firm DLA Piper, and a distinguished advisor for the Pew Charitable Trusts. Prior to those positions, Congressman Dent served te seven terms in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the 15th con con Congressional District of Pennsylvania. Before his time in the U.S. Representatives, Congressman Dent served for six years in the Pennsylvania State Senate and eight years in the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania House of Representatives. With Charlie is David Legrand. David graduated from Kelvin College with a Bachelor of Arts degree in history. After graduate work in history at the University of Michigan, David earned a law degree from the University of Chicago. When David returned to Grand Rapids, he worked at Warner, Norcross, and Judd before serving for eight years as the assistant King County prosecutor. In the prosecutor's office, David concentrated on upholding convictions on appeal and on prosecuting domestic violence crimes. David has also been active in the West Michigan business community. In 2002, the Legrands and their neighbors opened the Wealthy Street Bakery in another revitalizing area of Grand Rapids. In 2013, the Legrands and partners opened Long Road Distillers, which operates a distillery and restaurants in Grand Rapids, Grand Haven, and Cadillac. David was elected to the Grand Rapids City Commission in 2007 and helped the city through difficult economic times. In 2015, he was elected to the 75th State House District, completing his third term in 2022. And of course, joining us again is Professor Ali to moderate our conversation. Javed, it's all yours. So in terms of how we'll manage this, I've got uh, a list of questions. I'll certainly uh, direct those to Congressman Dent and David, and then we'll get their perspectives in around 4.15. We'll try to uh, break and get questions that you um, uh, submit it. If I don't manage to break this computer, that hopefully they will uh, show up on uh, on screen here. So we'll try and do that um, for the last um, aspect or segment of of uh, the panel. But with that said, let's get into to the first question, and I'll start with this question to David, and then turn to uh, Congressman Dent for his perspective. So, um, David, to you first. How is polarization more generally and political violence specifically impacted the people you have worked with? and served in each of your roles? Yeah, so I, I don't know what how, how dire Congressman Dent thinks this is. And just as an aside, I don't know if I owe you a debt of gratitude because I spent a lot of time uh, getting the Pew Trust to come to Michigan to work on criminal justice reform. And they came and invested a couple million bucks in our expungement work. And the Aspen Institute is working in Grand Rapids right now on justice stuff. So uh, it's funny that we have those points of commonality. So, so thank you. Uh, um, uh, you know, I, my politicians have to get good at like putting things into sound bites and one liners. It's sort of like being a bad comedian. So um, one of the things that I say about polarization right now is the worst thing you can do if your house is on fire is pretend your house isn't on fire. Um, I am really actively concerned about the ongoing viability of the American experiment. Um, I am not sure that we are going to have a stable republic in 20 years, and that scares the daylights out of me. And I think it really comes down to two things which are intertwined. Uh, one is hyperpolarization, and the other is lack of voter trust in elected officials. And I think that it, it's always dangerous inside of the political bubble um, you know, to, to form relationships and work with people and trust them and think that the general population is going to see that and understand the levels of, of bipartisan cooperation that happen all the time. So, you know, I was pacing around up here and some of you saw me. I was on the phone with a couple of Republicans who I'm working with very closely <coughs> on something right now. Um, I, after about, you know, four years in Lansing, just kind of stopped seeing party. I just saw people who were willing to work on ex issue A or, or not uh, and people I had to talk to about stuff. So. It's possible to work in a very nonpartisan way in a not 
in a not cheap way. I, I think that sometimes the, the cheap way it gets sold in the media is, oh, you know, Congressman Dent and I fight like mad, but then we go have drinks afterwards. That's cheap. Um, what's, what's deeper is, I will tell you, um, former Congressman Peter Meyer and I are friends. Uh, I think I, I trust his heart. I think that he is a good man with integrity. Uh, and I appreciate his, I really, really have appreciated his public service. And he is a Republican and I'm a Democrat. And that is, everything I just told you is absolutely true. Now, maybe my Democratic friends don't want to hear that, but that is the actual truth. Um, I think that I always, uh, those two problems, I use a marriage analogy for both of them. I say, you know, if Melissa, my wife, and I only ever fought, we would eventually get divorced. I don't want America getting divorced. I don't know what it would look like, and it scares me. Um, if we can't figure out how to disagree with people without imputing malice to the people we disagree with, democracy ceases to work. A necessary precondition for democracy is the ability to disagree without imputing malice. And the thought experiment I always have on this is, if you say to the average Democrat, uh, Mitch McConnell, they essentially think Satan. And if you say to the average Republican, Nancy Pelosi, they, they, they essentially think Satan. And I know this in my own family, most of them are liberals, and I have to constantly say to them, Mitch McConnell, I guarantee you, Mitch McConnell does not wake up in the morning trying to do evil. I promise you, that is not what he thinks when he gets up in the morning. How can I make the world worse? Um, nor does Nancy Pelosi. But, but we've gotten so hyperpartisan that we start with an assumption of malice, and then we work backwards from that. And we've got to, we've got to fix that dynamic. We've got to fix it or our republic fails. Now, the other thing we got to fix is voter trust, and, and it's intertwined. Um, and again, my marriage analogy on that is, if Melissa stopped trusting me, the solution wouldn't be to tell her to trust me. The solution would be to figure out how to be more trustworthy, how to regain her trust. And it's, hard, it's easy inside the bubble to think, oh, voters are misinformed, they're watching the wrong, radio, they're watching the wrong TV stations. Um, you know, you can come up with re millions of reasons. Like, I, I can virtually guarantee you that if Congressman Dent and I worked together, we'd wind up trusting each other, we'd be able to do all kinds of exciting, effective things together. But it'd be easy for us to think, if the voters don't understand that, they're just confused, they're wrong, it they're, doesn't matter. The why about voter distrust doesn't matter. The weather is a crisis. 40% of this country thinks the last election was invalid. That is a crisis inflection point. And if we can't figure out, that means they don't trust anybody in elected office if they're not on their team. So it's, it's related to the partisan problem. But forget about the partisanship for a matter. That level of distrust means democracy is about to break, as far as I can see. So if we can't walk back from that brink, nothing else matters. No other policy things you think about matter because you're not gonna have a voice if we don't have a democracy. Uh, you know, if we, if we lurch into autocracy or, or an oligarchy or some other form of government, all of our individual inputs aren't gonna matter anymore. The whole thing, whether you care about global warming or tax rates, all of our lives, we've assumed that our voices mattered. Well, they're not going to matter if we can't figure out how to keep democracy functioning. I mean, that is the core crisis. I, my joke on this, I say I went to Lansing thinking that I was going to work on criminal justice, and it turned out I had to work on saving the republic. I mean, I was in Lansing. I mean, I have colleagues who were summoned to the White House to try to throw the election. They were asked by the President of the United States to throw the election for them. And they thought about it because the President asked them. Um, I was in the room when Rudy Giuliani was perfectly willing to posit that there is a decades-long conspiracy of half of the country. Now, amazingly, no, Demo no senile Democrats ever admitted this. No child Democrat has ever said mommy and daddy are off at the conspiracy to overthrow elections. But Rudy Giuliani was perfectly willing to posit that half the country, <clears throat> Democrats in his case, were plotting to overthrow elections. Now, if, if Democrats wind up in the same mindset, we're done. We have to figure out how to operate in good faith with each other and nothing, nothing is more important because it's all premised on that. 
So I don't know if I answered your question, but, <laughs> but at least I wanted, to, I wanted to say that to all of you because like that is what I'm saying all the time to everybody, every chance I get, because I really loved growing up in a stable democracy. It was awesome. And I grew up feeling sorry for people who lived in Latin America or unstable uh, uh, attempts at democracy in Africa. And I never thought that I'd be sitting in the United States of America um, talking about the big lie and talking about things that are foundationally disrupting our ability to do this together. Congressman Dan, um, I don't know if you want to step back and address the original question or pick up on some of the points that, uh, that David just made. Maybe I'll just try to take up on some of the points that uh, David made and maybe just try to add to what he said, much of which I agree with. Uh, I, I, and first, let me, let me thank everybody at, at Grand Valley State for having me and, and, and the Howenstein Center as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. My friend Steve Carey introduced me to you, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this. Uh, but let me just say a couple things. I think one of the, what's driving so much of the discord is just the, the level of anger in the country, um, and, and on, on both the right and the left. Uh, you know, and I've often said, that, and, that's, and I'll, I'll pick on the right for a second, you know, like, like the, uh, the, the Trumpian right, the MAGA right, you know, that in many respects, that anger is is directed at more of a cultural level. That, you know, when you learn, when Donald Trump first ran for office, you know, it was the immigrants, it was the, the Mexicans, it was the Muslims, it was the Chinese. Um, and, and there was a lot of anger expressed at certain groups at a, on a cultural level. That's why you're miserable. On the left, you know, I'll, I'll pick on the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren wing of the party. You know, it's an economically based anger. You know, it's the pharmaceutical companies, it's, the, it's big oil and gas. Uh, you, you know, it's the insurance industry, it's the rich guy, it's all economically based, but it's all anger. And, and I've often felt it's two different sides of the same coin. When people are this angry, you know, it's really hard for them to sit down and, and then try to negotiate and, and talk to each other instead of yelling at each other. Uh, so that's just something I wanted to get off my chest. That is, and, and I think what drives a lot of this is, uh, you know, that we don't, <laughs> there's so much variety in, in this country that you know, we don't have a, a common sense of who we are, it seems, at the moment. And that wasn't always the case in America. Uh, you know, people get their information from sources that reinforce their existing opinions or biases, and many don't change the channel or go to a different site. Uh, and you know, we have social media and other media that, that egg this on. I mean, look what just happened to Fox News. Uh, you know, they just settled for what, nearly $780 billion over a lawsuit for you know, their, their, their misrepresentations, and I'm putting that ki kindly, uh, of what happened after the 2020 election, uh, all to maintain an audience, even though they obviously knew better that what they were pushing was not, was not true. Uh, and, and so you have you know, you know, institutions like that that have enormous power uh, that are you know, generating, in this case, uh, false information and seemingly knowingly. Uh, and, and there's not a whole lot of accountability for it. But you know, again, people are motivated by ratings. They're motivated by clicks. There was a time when members like David and myself, you mentioned my good friend Peter Meyer. I mean, I was, I was, I was uh, heartbroken when he lost that primary. Um, you know, here was a guy who came to Washington for all the right reasons to represent a community, and, and he, I, I got to know him. He engaged seriously and substantively on on issues, and we need more of that. You know, I, you know, too much of the politics today is performative. You know, I, I'm kind of old school. I'm not. I'm not really that smart or that special. But I kind of came to Congress. I thought the old-fashioned way to represent the community I grew up in, uh, and to be pretty pragmatic, understand its needs, and try to represent those interests in, in the Congress, you know, as well as try to work, you know, to, to my, the best of my ability to, to support what's in the best interest of the country. And I always felt that my district and the country's interests were largely aligned. And so it's a, and so that's where I, I, I think we've kind of gotten off base. Uh, and also this institution bashing that goes on. Now I'm going to speak to my Republican friends on this. When I would hear my Republican friends say, you know, oh, you're the establishment. And I would say, well, geez, you know, I thought a lot of Republicans I knew growing up were leaders in their communities. They were, the, they were part of the establishment. They sat on the boards of the YMCA, the hospitals, uh, in the schools. They were, they were in small business or they were professionals in many cases. Uh, and they were trying to, they, they invested in their communities, um, not just financially, but 
personally and emotionally. They wanted their communities to be strong. They didn't want to burn it down. So they, they, their interest was to, to help the community. If that made them the establishment, is that such a terrible thing? I, I thought they were leaders. And and just to say that you know, by your party establishment, you're somehow crooked. I mean, I, I just... I don't know how we got so off base. And now that we attack institutions on a regular basis, people attack the Defense Department now, which had sort of been able to stay out of the politics, but now they're getting dragged into the culture wars. You know, the FBI, uh, we go down a lot, the media, uh, you know, Congress itself. I mean, there's so many institutions that, we, uh, that people have lost faith or trust in. In some cases, it might have been justified. In others, maybe not so much. But these never-ending attacks on institutions uh, that help undergird a society in order to maintain a strong democracy. I would say it's not just about having elections. Hell, the old Soviet Union, they had elections too. They didn't mean anything, but you need a, a free press, an independent judiciary, rule of law, all these things that, that, that really undergird our system are so important. So I, I'm not, I still think our institutions are holding, believe it or not. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not ready to say it's all lost, but I do worry about civil, civil disorder at times. I, I, I truly do. And I, and I worry that if, you know, these institutions become too weak, at some point we could have a very real problem. I'm not saying we're there now. And I hope we never get there. But we have to be cognizant of it. And I think it's important for elected officials, uh, particularly at the national level, to understand that, you know, they, they have a job to do. They have, an, they have an affirmative responsibility to govern. They have to get beyond this whole notion of separation of parties. We have a system of separation of powers. And, and I find that the, the party... The members in the legislative body, the Congress, of the same party, the president, think it's their job, whether it's Republican or Democrat, to defend their party's president, whatever they're doing. Even when they're doing things that might undermine their own institution, Congress, and its authorities. I've seen that happen repeatedly. Uh, you know, I saw it happen in the Trump era when he just wanted to move money from military construction projects to a, uh, a border wall without a vote of Congress. You can have a debate on the policy. But nothing like that should have ever happened, moving money like that without a congressional authorization or appropriation to do so. Joe Biden, similarly, with the student debt relief. I mean, you can argue whether it's good policy or not, but should a president of the United States be able to wave up to over $300 billion worth of student debt without a vote of the Congress? I mean, you know, you would think that both Democrats and Republicans would have been alarmed by both situations, not just, you know, when their party uh, did it or... Uh, so that's what we're up against. And so uh, that, I hope that adds to what David uh, uh, conveyed to all of you, but uh, happy to take additional questions. Yeah, thanks, Congressman Dent, for that. And both of you done a really good job sort of diagnosing the problem as it exists and all these different uh, dimensions that, that have just been covered. But um, I want to ask uh, sort of a different question that you both can, can provide your personal perspective on. So uh, obviously both um, are you know, very accomplished at the political level. You run for office multiple times. Um, how does this environment that we've just talked about, um, or you each just talked about, in this you know, in increased polarized state we're in as a country, how does that affect the, the way people think about running for elected office, either you as individuals uh, or just you know folks who are eager to get into that arena, but haven't yet sort of dipped their toe into the elected world. Congressman Dent, I don't know if you want to take that one. First. Yeah, sure. Let me let me start this. Look, right now, I don't know if, if, if I was starting all over again, I don't know if I'd run for office because I, <laughs> I I thought, you know, I, I so many people who are getting into this game right now are running with a very hard ideological agenda. Uh, I mean, I, I was always more of a pragmatic kind of guy, you know, kind of, again, representing my community. That's why I was getting involved to help people in my community. It wasn't so much about Republican, Democrat. I mean, I was running a Republic, as a Republican in a district that are more Democrat. So I had to figure out a way to speak to people who are not just part of my tribe, so to speak. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the big concerns, that, uh, the, big, the greatest concern I have is the way we nominate candidates for office these days. The way we nominate candidates through the primary system really seems to reward those who are more on the uh, extreme elements. And in Pennsylvania, I'm not sure, sure Michigan, I think you're like us, a first across the post type system. That is whoever gets the most votes in the primary wins. So if there are 10 candidates running and the winner gets 25% of the vote, well, guess what? That's, that's the, he got the most votes, he's, he's the nominee. And oftentimes uh, some of these more extreme candidates can get through in these multi-candidate crowded primaries, they can get through. And, and, and since the districts are so lopsided, either Republican or Democrat, 
that uh, they don't have to worry about general elections. And so I think this is a not an inconsequential problem that the center right, the center center left to center right on the political spectrum, I believe, is grossly underrepresented in many of our legislative bodies these days. Uh, they're just even though I would argue that center left to center right on the political spectrum is probably where the vast majority of Americans are. You know, maybe maybe 25 percent call themselves very liberal or progressive, maybe 25 percent call them very uh, conservative. But I would argue that probably so closer to 50 percent of the vote out there is somewhere between center left to center right. And uh, and that that group, I think, feels a bit uh, disenfranchised. Uh, you know, I mean, there's there, I mean, I think there's I don't know. There's probably every voter out there. I suspect many people in this audience feel as I do, that there are things about their party that they like and there are things in their party that they don't like. There are things about the other party that they like and, and don't like. I mean, that's just the way it is. And, uh, and it just seems that we lost something when our parties became much more ideologically conformed. Uh, you know, our parties used to be broad-based coalitions. And because of that, that had a moderating influence on legislation. So, you know, you had the Democratic Party that had, you know, very conservative members from the South, for example, and the Republican Party that had more moderate or liberal members from the Northeast and Midwest. And that and so neither side on their own could jam the other because, you know, there were conservatives on the Democratic side, moderates on the Republican side. And but that's changed. You know, there were there weren't those types of uh, controls within the parties to, to kind of keep a check on the more extreme elements within the parties. Right now, the, the check is gone, uh, you know, at least within the parties. And that's changed. And so this gets back down to what I said earlier, how we go about nominating candidates. We have to figure out how to do this better. David? 100%. I mean, I think, uh, look, you, you've got two people here who have thought about this a lot, and we're not going to get all of the ideas out of our brains in the next 45 minutes. Um, because we could probably talk about this for literally days unscripted and just bounce back and forth and, and agree with each other about essentially everything and say, yes, but also this. So so let me say yeah, yes, but also a couple yes, but also this things. Um, I think that one of the, as I think about doing the work of politics, one of the things that I think about is constantly, constantly messaging that I make mistakes. Why? Because if the standard for, I mean, the, the old, when, I remember when, uh, uh, you know, one of our presidential candidates was, was criticized for uh, being a flip-flopper. And my, the line I developed at that point was, if you don't change your mind once in a while, how do you know you have one? Um, in other words, we should be able to, politicians, I think elected officials have to constantly be willing to say, you know what, I could be wrong. And I make mistakes all the time. I'm trying, I'm doing my best here. Um, I'm trying to look at all the information, but acknowledge the limitations. I mean, one of the huge limitations is politicians have to be generalists. You have to have opinions on healthcare and prescription drugs and also on the criminal justice system and also on energy transmission. I mean, there's a lot of things that really, frankly, you can't fit in one brain. And at the end of the day, you have this binary thing where you have to vote on all this stuff. Uh, so I think that politicians signaling that they're not absolutely right on everything. Uh, I mean, that absolute rightness fits into this partisanship, right? Like the Republicans, if you're a Democrat, have to be absolutely wrong on everything and we have to be absolutely right on everything. Well, you pick me an, uh, 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 an issue and I can tell you where I am on it, but I can also tell you that I see non-trivial arguments on the other side. Um, non-trivial substantive arguments on the other side of virtually anything that divides Democrats and Republicans. So being able to articulate you know, ambiguity, fallibility, all of those things are really important. Um, look, we're in a college, so let me give you all two book assignments. <laughs> um, uh, ben Sass, who is a, a senator, wrote a great book. I think it was called Other. Um, and one of the, and he pointed out that what there's another book called The Three Languages of Politics, and that's a short read, but they're both worth reading. The Three Languages of Politics, the central point the guy, the, the author makes is, when politicians talk, they're not actually talking to people who disagree with them. They almost always ever, only ever talk to whip up their own base. So they, they're not really interested in crossing. So when you think about that, and he argues that there's sort of three mindsets out there, that Democrats think, think in terms of victims and oppressors, and that libertarians think about government versus liberty, and that conservatives think about culture and order versus chaos. So 
but but that usually then if you go to think about a rally and you know Trump made rallies famous but we all have rallies and all of the bad behavior that happens in rallies because it's a big group of people who you think are all on your side and it's easy for politicians to lapse into the republicans want to the republicans are this or you know I mean those are the rallies I go to right and it's easy to lapse into that um, I once went to a uh, meeting of a bunch of elected officials where the, it was an environmental group and they put up a picture and it was, a ca it was all the Republican leadership in, in, in Michigan. And underneath it said villains. And then the next frame was a bunch of my friends and it said, and they were striding off into the sunset and it said heroes. And I was like, I don't think Mike Shirky wakes up in the morning trying to do evil. Like, why are you doing this? Why, why are you making this hill? I mean, and this was a, a secondary group, right? It wasn't even the politicians themselves, but feeding into this narrative, it, Ben Sass talks about this as a negative community. That we used to have positive communities where you're like, we're part of your church and you're part of your, your clubs and you're part of the rotary or whatever, and you're trying to build towards something. And that we seem to have lurched into negative communities where we define ourselves and are, are by other people who are angry about about the same stuff we're angry about and who want to tear down the same things we want to tear down. And that's a very toxic, dangerous space, but it's easier to sustain in thin formats like the internet. It's harder to sustain in richer formats like this. Like I know a lot of people in this audience, so there's a limit to how obnoxious I'm going to get <laughs> because you're going to, you're going to hold me accountable afterwards. Right? Like, I see you, you see me. So the fact that this is happening live matters. The fact that, that, that you're, if you're in a community, that matters. Well, so, so much of that civility uh, depends on making sure we have more rich forms of communication. So, you know, Zoom is better than a phone call. A phone call is better than an email. An email is better than text. Uh, we all know that the, like, the thinner your communication gets, the easier it is for things to get off the rail. Um, and so I think that it's hard work. What I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry, Congressman, I, I, let, me, let me, one last thing that I want to say. I think the human brain is hardwired to want silver bullet answers. Like, just, just tell me I can drive a Prius and then I never have to think about polar bears again. Or just tell me I can recycle and then I don't have to think about global warming anymore. Um, the complex problems tend to take long, slow, complex solutions. So if we're going to fix some of this stuff, it's not going to happen overnight. There's not going to be a bill we can introduce that can fix this. Um, but we all have to think about like how can we rebuild community and how can we build enduring community. And one of my mantras is nobody ever changed their mind because you were mad at them. If you actually care about your stuff and you're committed to it and you want to change somebody's mind, people only change their minds if they feel loved, accepted, and safe. So start all of your conversations by trying, by big grounding in those commitments. Try to make the people you're talking to feel loved, accepted, and safe, or you're wasting your time, or you're just building negative community. Congressman, any, um, anything you want to respond to based on what David said? Yeah, I, I just think, yeah, well, first, um, I think David said something about, you know, changing your mind, you know, like, but what do they say? You know, people never change their, their minds, never change anything. I think that was Churchill who said that, something to that effect. But, you know, we, you know, you, you know we, we come into elected office knowing what we know and realizing once you get there that there are a lot of things you just don't know. And you have to spend a lot of time learning. And you're not always learning in a, in a partisan environment. You're just getting information about whatever the issue is. Then you need to make a decision. And it's not always about what's a Republican view or a Democratic view. Uh, I guess the one thing I, I, I'd say, too, about Republicans and Democrats, that people have to, uh, you know, this negative partisanship. That it's not that, you know, as a Republican, many will say, well, it's not that I like Republicans that much, but I just can't stand those guys, the other side. They're, they're, they're bad, they're evil, they're, they're just, uh, you know, they, they think I'm stupid, they think I'm a knuckle dragger, they think I'm a racist, they think I'm all kinds of terrible things. And a lot of some Democrats will look at Republicans and say, you know, they are, you know, they're, they, they are knuckle draggers and they look at me like I'm a, uh, like I'm a communist and, uh, and that I, you know, and that just, you know, and I hate the cops and that's how they view me. Uh, and, 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 and it just seems to me that, that that's how we define each other, that, you know, not that we like our, our own tribe that much, but we so much despise the other that we'll tolerate a, th a lot of things from our own tribe that we would never tolerate within our own families. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in terms of how we conduct ourselves. And I think that's a, that is not a small part of the problem. 
you know, facing the, the country right now, that we have to get beyond, we have to figure out a way to, to get beyond this. And so part of what I do on a daily basis, I work at the Aspen Institute and I, I run a congressional program and I, I convene meetings with members of Congress you know, off the record. Uh, we do it off the record. You know, we're discreet. You know, we just, we talk about substantive policy issues. You know, great power competition between U.S. and uh, U.S. and Russia and China. Or we talk about energy security and climate change or, or, you know, how we grow our food, you know, agriculture and health or AI and privacy. And, you know, you'd, you'd be shocked, you know, when you're behind closed doors and there are no cameras in the rooms, you're just talking substance and policy, how much agreement there is. And, you know, about problems. And, and sometimes you're not able to translate that into the into the public in, in the public setting, but but we're working on it, <laughs> and so um, so these are some of the things that, that we can do. But but again, I, I just get back to you know we at some point we're going to have to turn the temperature down in this country, uh, and that uh, this whole notion of populism on the right and the left, you know I, I understand it. We all have to take popular positions from time to time, but I, I get worried about illiberal populist movements or very progressive populist movements, um, uh, because it, it, it quickly morphs into demagoguery. And, and, I, and I think that's something we have to kind of get back to. I'm, I'm kind of like a, you know, maybe an Eisenhower type of Republican, you know, some, and your General Ford, you know, for, for, for whom is so much in the Grand Rapids area is uh, named in his old congressional district. I mean, this is, these are the kinds of people that I always, you know, grew up and learned to admire. And people were, you know, they're, they're patriots. These were all patriots wanted to make the country better, and they didn't see their opposition as, as an enemy, but there's maybe some people who disagreed with them. It, it wasn't, their, their job wasn't to try to destroy them every single day. It was to try to find areas of agreement and move on. All right, Congressman Dent, thanks for that. Um, I can also, through this device that I have not, met, not yet managed to crash, I can see there are a number of audience questions uh, rolling in, so I'm gonna call a little bit of an audible here and start to, to get to some of these uh, audience questions two in no uh, particular uh, order, but this is an interesting one that, that I just flagged. Um, so David, start with you and then uh, Congressman Dent, um, you can respond to this as well. But the question is, do either of you have a moment of bipartisanship that you're really proud of during your time in office? Wow, sure. uh, yeah, uh, I'll tell you, so, so I'll give you my, for me, it's not just bipartisanship, it's, consensus. So what I'm really, well, I'll tell you what I'm most proud of uh, on, the, on that scale. And that is, I was in Lansing for seven years, three and a half terms. And generally speaking, I think the only things I ever saw pass unanimously were highway naming bills. Um, so if we were, if we were on, um, with one exception, and that is, I had a bill package to get 400,000 parents off of a government watch list. Uh, Child Protective Services has a, had this vast, overbloated list of parents who they had, who they were categorizing as dangerous, and they re, they acknowledged to me in in a, in a first meeting that they had four hundred thirty thousand people in this registry. They thought about 30,000 of them should be kept on the registry. So I, my jaw hit the floor. It's like, you, you're telling me you got 400,000 extra people on our government watch list? Well, that's an issue, which if you go to Republicans, you can be like, look, how about we get the government out of people's lives? And they're like, uh-huh. And you go to Democrats and you say, look, there are lots of good parents who screwed up and a lot of them are less affluent. And how about we get the government out of their lives? And the liberals say, uh-huh. So I went out and I, and I worked and got a nine bill package and I gave five of the nine bills to Republicans because they're in majority. Um, that bill, that nine bill package, which helped 400,000 parents, passed unanimously out of the House and the Senate. Not one person in the legislature voted against it in either the House or the Senate. So that I'm proud of. And, and I know that's gonna endure because everybody voted for it. It's not a political football. It's not gonna change when majority shifts. Congressman Dent, time or a, a moment uh, in your own career where you're most proud of? Well, yeah, in terms of like bipartisan successes, I had a number of them, but I guess I'll just say when I was on the Appropriations Committee, and I was a senior member of the committee, and I, I was responsible for military construction projects and the VA funding. And every year, I passed we passed the bill with, on a bipartisan basis, uh, and uh, and I did that with we did that with many of the bills that came through our committee. 
And I was proud of that because, you know, it was the only I always felt it was the only committee in Congress that had to do something every year, which was to fund the government. And and what I learned is that, uh, you know, we could have members who were polar opposite ideologically. But what I found is that there were members I'll pick on two in particular, uh, Tom Cole, a Republican of, in, of uh, Oklahoma and Rosa Dora, uh, Democratic Connecticut. He's a very strong conservative and she's a very strong progressive. But each year they would pass a labor, health, human services, education funding bill. And they did a lot of good things in there, you know, for the National Institutes of Health and the CDC. And they did it. But they, they, they understood the limits of what the other could do. You know, they knew how far they could go. And that's how they would negotiate. Yeah, I mean, the Republican didn't get everything he wanted. She didn't get all that she wanted. Uh, and they, it, it forced them both to, you know, basically, you know, reject the more the, the more hard edge proposals. Um, they, they rejected it in order to get consensus. Same thing I used to have to do on, on the number of bills I worked on over the years. I needed to get these things passed. And they're, sometimes you just have to give the other side. You have to leave something on the table for them you know, if, if you want them to buy into it. But I've also I've seen a lot of people, though, in, in legislative bodies oh, operate in not so good faith or bad faith, uh, where, you know, I thought, too, that if we're working on a bill and I I help them, I put things in for them, then I expect them to vote for the bill. <laughs> and I'm finding what's happening a lot now is that there are a lot of people who make demands all the time but have no intention of ever supporting the policy, even with some of their ideas are incorporated into it. I mean, that's not acting in good faith. I mean, that's, uh, and so that's another thing that I've noticed it's happened um, more and more. I mean, it's always happened, but it's happening far too often now. And you're going to see this happen in the debt ceiling debate. It's going on in Washington as we speak, where you see, you know, right now the, the Republicans in the House are trying to pass a bill that has zero chance of passing the Senate. You know, and I would always say the leadership when I was in, you know, I'll help you pass this bill. It's going nowhere. But if that's going to bring some of these guys along for the final vote, well, then, OK, if they need to vote for that in order to vote for the final package, I get it. But that's not what's happening now. There, many of those folks are not going to vote for the final package, so they're just making noise. And that's a, that's a real frustration. So it comes down to this. You, you, need to give the other, you need to give the other guy something. But then when the other guy gets something, he has to be part of the process and say yes, too. And, um, that's, and, and somehow we've, we've lost that muscle memory. You know, now that we have, we're in an era of performative politics where the political reward system isn't so much for consensus or compromise, it rewards it rewards those who, uh, you know, really tack to the extremes. How does a Marjorie Taylor Greene raise a gazillion dollars with the crazy things she has said about, you know, the plane not crashing into the Pentagon, Jewish space lasers, and I'm probably forgetting a gazillion other things <laughs> she said. But, you know, but she's able to raise a lot of money. They can monetize this type of notoriety or monetize crazy. And that there's a reward for that now. As opposed to, okay, you do a good job passing an appropriations, but what's the reward there? Are you going to be rewarded by, by your voters for that in the primary? Probably not. Uh, so these are all challenges that we uh, confront in the system that we have. Uh, another really interesting audience question that sort of connects back to both the, you know these um, personal stories for you. Um, so this question is um, it's kind of building off the last one. Uh, can you share a time when your mind was changed uh, through your work in politics and what, what, what about that person or the interaction did you, you know, was so impactful to you or that you remember the most? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to, to take that one first. I mean, over the years, and you know, I came in the, the state legislature in 1990, I liked the 90s to start serving in 91. In 1996, I voted for the Defense of Marriage Act, which at the time, you know, I thought that was, it said no, you know, that marriage should be between a man and a woman. And, and okay, you know, but over time, you know, I, I talked to a number of people and, you know, then in 2004, I, 2014, I guess it was, um, it was after Obama won re-election, after President Obama won re-election, uh, not too long after that. You know, I, I came out and said, you know, look, you know, love is love and who am I to judge? And and I'm, um, you know, this is a, a person's idea of happiness, you know, marriage. And I, I you know, between same sex couples, I, I have no issue. Didn't impose it on any religious institutions, but, you know, for civil marriage, sure. You go ahead and get married in any any church that would allow it, or any, certainly at any government um, building or uh, office. 
uh, or it should be permitted. And so I, you know, I learned, but I, but you learn that by talking to people. And you know, the country changed, the culture changed, and I changed with it. And you know, and and so you're you're persuaded uh, by arguments. And there's some other things here and there that I'm sure that you know I wish I could have done differently or done over, or somebody has made an argument that was uh, impactful. And uh, you know, got me to vote uh, on a particular way on, a, on an issue. Sure. Yeah, I, I guess I would say um, maybe one of the biggest shifts for me was on how I thought about tax breaks, and uh, that was colleagues of mine questioning, you know, uh, sort of point source like like the tax breaks that Ford Motor Company's gotten recently and those kinds of things. And people came back and said like, okay, look at the math. How do, does the math work on this? Um, you know, if you're given $700,000 per job to a corporation, how does that actually scale out? And, and people who talked about automation and, you know, the likelihood that those jobs wouldn't be permanent. And I thought, well, okay, like, it's, it's important to do the math on these things and not take the knee jerk. And, and one of the ways that tax breaks are often sold is, my gosh, if Michigan doesn't get it, Kentucky will. I'm like, I don't hate people in Kentucky. We're not, I'm not at war with Kentucky. Um, so the, 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 the race to the bottom on, on tax giveaways is something that I really started questioning. And it was because uh, I had colleagues who just were like, wait a minute, where's the beef? Like, you know, let's let's crack this open and think about the policy. It, you know, those things make great, and I often think, you know, the, the structural incentives of institutions, any institution will have weak points. So democracy's got plenty of weak points. Um, capitalism has got weak points. Um, the media, one of the biggest media weak points I think that exists is conflict sells. Uh, if, you know, if Congressman Dent had been here and we were rolling around on the floor punching each other, that would be on TV tonight. This conversation is probably not going to be on TV tonight because peaceful, reasonable conversations don't sell media exposure. Fights sell. And that's, that's a big, you know, that's a non-trivial part of the political toxicity is it works for the media. And we have to name that problem and challenge the media to walk away from uh, conflict-based uh, representation of things because they over-represent conflict in politics all the time. There's never been a warm story about me and uh, Peter Meyer and my friendship. I mean, Peter Meyer came over to my house and we drank till about midnight before he decided to run for Congress. And he talked it through with me and I'm a Democrat and he wanted my advice and he wanted my counsel. And we spent hours talking about why, why he wanted to run for Congress, whether the reasons were good enough, what it was gonna involve. That's not a media story, right? I mean, it's, it could be, but it's not usually. Usually the stories are, ah, David LeGrand's fighting with Marjorie Taylor Greene or something, right? Uh, those are just much more fun. So uh, I think the media, the media's it, it got a characteristic weakness there. Um, you know, so we, we, I, think we have to, I think we have to be honest about and, and, and recognize characteristic, characteristic weaknesses. I think one of the big characteristic weaknesses of democracy right now is how much money is in politics. And I can't speak to this firsthand, but I hear that congressmen and women have to spend an awful lot of time fundraising. Well, every minute they spend fundraising is a minute they're not spending talking to their colleagues. Um, the amount of time and energy that goes into fundraising is really problematic if you want to build collaboration and congeniality and relationships because there's only 24 hours in a day. There's a, you, you, if you do something, you're not doing something else. Yeah. So we've got time probably for a couple more questions and a lot are rolling in um, through the, the screen here and I've got a few left. So I'll try to combine these um, into kind of wrap up questions. So I spent about 45 minutes sort of diagnosing the problems that we have here in the country and some of the, the challenges that, that we face you know, at the institutional level and the political level and in the media. But let's try to end on a more positive note because uh, I'm the eternal optimist, even in the world that I came from in counterterrorism. Everything is never as bad as it seems. So um, let's let's try to end there with some of these uh, questions. So um, one, one question here on uh, or you know, maybe I'll try to kind of put it in a perspective. So um, despite everything we've, we've talked about, how can we as a country or as Americans kind of move uh, in a more positive direction or find that sort of common ground that's been lacking? And are there issues that are either bipartisan or just kind of bring us together as a country that can hopefully start to 
um, edge off some of the more extreme you know, aspects of what we're, we're seeing here. So let me put that out to, to Congressman Dent and then David for your response. Sure, there, there are always areas of agreement. I think, for example, okay, you see in Congress right now, there, there, there seems to be an emergency, an emergency, an emerging consensus on China. Now, I'm not saying it's a great consensus, but they seem to be um, recognizing the, you know, the challenges and the threats posed by China. I think, frankly, personally, that the rhetoric's a bit too hot on all sides, both here in the United States and over there in China, both Republican, Democrat here, right. both the president and Congress too hot, but nevertheless, they seem to be coming to some um, you know, consensus. Uh, I hope it's one that's positive and it's thoughtful and it's, you know, it's, it's more balanced than it maybe is right now. Uh, other issues, uh, I, I would say on, 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 on privacy and technology and how do you deal with the big tech and artificial intelligence. These are issues that nece shouldn't necessarily be partisan uh, that, but I, I think they all recognize, whether you're Republican or Democrat, that we need, you know, we need to better understand how how this technology is is affecting our lives, and and you know, uh, and big companies and others that are having access to our data. I think most Republicans and Democrats would probably agree there need to be some limits on out there on, on an issue like that. I, I would have told you too that infrastructure was an issue of bipartisan. Uh, a bipartisan agreement. We saw that to a limited extent in the last Congress. Uh, you know, it would have been a, well, it could have been a bigger vote in my opinion, but nevertheless, it was a bipartisan vote. Uh, so there are some issues out there. I would like to think, and what's most troubling though, is where there, there should be more bipartisan consensus and there isn't, is in foreign policy. Now, America has interests, and I've always said this, when, you know, from year to year, you know, whether it's a Democratic or Republican administration, the relationships between countries often don't change that much. You know, we have, you know, we have national interests, they have national interests. It shouldn't be, it's not so personality driven. And I, I worry, uh, and I, it bothers me, uh, that the foreign policy consensus that sustained our country so well in the years to, uh, after the Second World War, you know, that, that consensus has you know, evaporated. It's, it's not where it was. You know, after that Berlin Wall came down, and I, know it's, and I would argue, you know, at some point, uh, you know, over the you know after the '90s and into the 2000s, that that consensus started to fray, and that's one area where I think we should be able to build a consensus about what we what the role of our country should be in the world. I'm not saying there should be a total uh, you know unanimity here, but there should be a consensus, whether as a Republican or a Democratic president, so we don't have these uh, these big swings in um, you know how we're perceived in the world. You know, we want to make sure the world can trust us as a nation. So I would just say that we need to do a better job in developing that consensus uh, on a bipartisan basis as it relates to our relations with other nations. David. So uh, let me denationalize this a little bit and I'm gonna summarize for you. Uh, I talked to a Rotary Club a couple days ago, so I'm gonna invite a ghost up on the stage, the ghost of Tommy Brand. Um, I, Tommy was a Republican rep uh, from Wyoming, as, as probably many of you know. and. I was invited to talk about roughly this kind of stuff. And so I said, that's great, I can talk, but I wanna bring a Republican. So I brought Tommy. And um, I, at the end of it, I said, look, you can name big issues that Tommy and I disagree about, even profound big issues like <laughs> abortion. Uh, I am pro-choice and Tommy is pro-life. Um, we can disagree about that issue without me being angry at Tommy and I said, the reason is because I know his heart. I know that Tommy is a good human being and he is trying to do good. He is a compassionate, concerned person. And that means if I disagree with him, I can move on to the next topic. Uh, and, and we don't always have to agree about everything. So I guess I think, when I think about how to solve, solve by the, the partisan divide, it just really keeps coming back to the human heart for me. Like we just have to figure out how to spend enough time with people to realize they're not, that the people who disagree with us are not demons. And, and I, you know, the, I used to use, this is an old kind of dated uh, image, but I used to confess that Sarah Palin and Bugs Bunny are kind of the same thing for me. They're this, this image that comes up on TV and says funny stuff and I laugh and it's easy. I, like I've never had Sarah Palin over to dinner. I don't see her as a human being. I see her as a cartoon because I'm only, that's my relationship with her, right? I don't really have a relationship with her. 
Tommy Brand, who I just told you about, I could make a Tommy <coughs> Brand a cartoon too, but I can't because I know him. And because I spent time with him, because I've listened to him, I've wrestled with issues uh, with Tommy. Well, we all need, I mean, we, I get so many people, I'm sure you do too, Congressman, saying, you know, I go home for dinner and like, you know, the family disagrees and I, I don't know what to do about it and we avoid, well, I think, I think we're all scared to talk about this stuff with people who disagree with us because we're scared of the anger. But the way we gotta get, get we, the way we gotta get through the anger is just ground in the love first. Ground in the love and assume that the people you're talking to are also capable of love. I know that sounds hopelessly Pollyannish, <laughs> and that is probably the least political answer I could have given. But, but I think it's true, and I, and I think that, look, if you believe in democracy, we're just a collection of individuals, and occasionally some of us you know, get delegated to go push buttons. But that doesn't mean I'm any more an important or interesting part of democracy than anybody else in this room. So it doesn't just have to happen in Congress or in Lansing or in city commission. It's got to happen at Thanksgiving. It's got to. Congressman Dan, any uh, final thoughts on that sort of perspective? What we can all do? Yeah, I mean, yeah. At the end of the day, it comes you know, maybe because you know I'm, I'm a former congressman and you know, have a fairly high profile, uh, so it's harder for me to do this. But for ordinary, for people who aren't elected, I should say that, you know, and for even for those who are elected, if, if people don't know my politics or don't know me, I like to have just normal conversations with people. And you'll find out you don't you don't talk about politics. You talk about whatever it is you're talking about. Or, you know, you, you go into the store and they're helping you with something. You don't ask their politics. And you realize that most people are fundamentally decent and good. Uh, that's and that's I think how we have we need to take that that spirit with us. You know, when we when we deal with each other in every in our everyday lives in a very normal and I think healthy way, we need to kind of translate that into the political space again. That you know, we're we're talking to our colleagues. We have to operate under the assumption that there, this the, my 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 uh, my uh, my colleague here is actually a good person, even if we might disagree or if I might think they're a little misguided on some things. It doesn't matter. You know, we should we have to get back to this. Not you know, st stop the demonization of the other side. But the system doesn't allow it that well. I mean, you're running for office, and you have to draw a hard contrast. I get it. But I thought we used to have rules, uh, at least at least as I understood them. You talk, you, you debate your opponent based on matters of public record. You try not to make it personal, uh, and you know you, you try to address the issue, not not them personally, and don't you know it's, it's the name calling and the ad hominem attacks. You know the the, the 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 discourtesy that is often demonstrated these days is is I think really troubling, and I and I'll blame social media for that, for part of that. I mean, people will say things on social media. You know, they'll post things that they would never say, you know, uh, to another person sitting across from them. They would never do that in an audience like this. But they feel like they feel empowered to do so in social media. Well, they'll, they'll, they'll say the nastiest of things about another human being, um, you know, and, and not address whatever the issue is. I, I don't mind if somebody wants to tell me my ideas are terrible and here's why. But they don't have to call me a jerk. You know, that's a, is what, is what I'm, I'm saying. And I shouldn't do the same to them. Uh, so that's where I kind of get back to it. How do you just get people to start talking to each other as just human beings with the, under the assumption that we're all basically fundamentally decent and honorable and then go from there? All right, Congressman Dent, uh, thank you for that. And uh, probably getting close to the end. So how about a big round of applause for, the, for David and Congressman